Chapter 14 Bright Future Cook County Hospital was the biggest hospital in America. And at one point after it was built in 1916, it had 3,000 beds. There were 25 operating rooms on the eighth floor, which was the length of a city block. The back of the ward on the sixth floor of Cook County Hospital had the sickly sweet smell of gangrene mixed with Dakin solution. We are tops. Don't you love it, Brad? Said Tom, the third year resident to his surgery intern. He had a way of turning the worst misfortune into an adventure you wanted to be part of. Tough on pus surgeons, said Brad. I gotta love it. You're letting me do the next amputation, right? It was early spring and the Frosties were coming in. Homeless people who had frozen their feet in the brutal Chicago winter and were being admitted with gangrene that threatened to take their limb or even their life. Some arrived in septic shock and a few were DOA. Hey, stud, run ahead and pull off everyone's dressing so we can inspect those necrotic appendages and see who is ready for the next amputation. Tom looked at the medical student assigned to their team. I'll buy you lunch in the cafeteria. Right, the medical student said with a laugh. He knew the food was free, but like most medical students, was eager to help. Free and unlimited cafeteria food was one of the perks of being a doctor in training at The Cook. The doctors worked up the row of beds until they arrived at a patient with a nasty blackened foot that had demarcated right above the ankle. Hey, Brad, this good buddy is all yours. A nice BKA with plenty of healthy skin for a good stump. Sir, you're going to walk better than ever with the new leg we are going to get you. Tom hovered over the bleary-eyed man who smiled through his dose of morphine. He was happy to be in a real bed and eat three meals a day. Just show me where to sign the papers, said Mr. Frost. Dr. Rosedale will come back and pre-op you, sir. Don't eat breakfast. You're NPO now. They worked their way along and Tom told Brad, let's get him scheduled right after we take out this old boozer's pancreas. Their sickest patient, Henry Dapper, was in a bed up front near the nurse's station. He was so sick and had so many lines going into his veins and orifices that rather than transfer him to a gurney, they were set to take him, still in his bed, directly to the operating room. An intractable alcoholic with acute on chronic end-stage pancreatitis. He had been in and out of the hospital for years. A bag of 5% alcohol solution hung attached to his central intravenous line. Without the alcohol drip, he would go into delirium tremens. Hey, Doc, I've been painting. You got something stronger than this shit they've been giving me? Come on, man. Tom asked the nurse to give the man a small shot of morphine. He was so debilitated that a little too much could kill him. This dose wasn't for the pain, though, and rather as a pre-op sedative. Dapper winced happily as the injection needle was plunged into the front of his thigh. Brad, finish here and meet us up in the OR. We should be done in a couple of hours. We're going to take our man's pancreas out, said Tom. He made a comical bow at a dapper who watched him curiously. Then he took the head of the bed while the med student took the foot, and they began wheeling the sick man toward the elevator. As the morphine absorbed into his circulation, a big happy smile came to dapper's lips, and he said, Ooh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I can take care of those gangrene dressings for you, Dr. Rosedale, said the nurse. Why don't you go on and take care of your other business? You're an angel, thank you, Brad said, and strode to the stairwell to bound down six flights. Tomorrow morning, he would bring the nurses a fresh box of donuts like he did every week. It was amazing how little things like that made life easier. He thought about Dapper guzzling cheap rum and vomiting blood until his blood count was so low he had to be admitted for transfusions. He thought of the Frosties. Some would purposely sit on the sidewalk in sub-zero weather with no shoes on, not caring if they lost a foot or a leg, believing they would get rescued to a bed and warm meals if they didn't die first. The self-destruction, the pain, where does it come from? I became a doctor to help people, but the thing they most need is to be saved from themselves. Why don't they care? The thoughts resounded in his brain, unsettling and unanswered. He crossed the street and entered Carl Meyer Hall. He could smell the gangrene on himself as he went through the resident's cafeteria line for a late breakfast. When he sat down with his tray, a shapely and lovely dental student he had met some weeks ago sat next to him. Hey, Brad. How are you doing? I hope she can't smell the dead feet on me. Okay, how are things? He said already with a mouthful of food. 
He was thinking about asking her for her number. Immediately, the phone number of the OR appeared on his pager. He called. Dr. Tom wants you to go to the ward and get the amputation patient right away and bring him up. Mr. Dapper had died on the table. There were complications as soon as they started excising his pancreas, and he went into cardiac arrest. If they didn't bring the next case immediately, they would lose the OR to another service that had a patient prepped and ready. Poor Mr. Dapper. He had trained a lot of medical students and residents with his numerous medical problems. Now he would train a pathology resident who would autopsy the extensive damage wreaked on the man's internal organs from decades of self-destructive behavior. Brad grieved for the man who had been homeless and had no visitors. The only reconciliation was that he was no longer suffering. The only question was, what destiny awaits his soul? Brad got to do the below the knee amputation, which took under 30 minutes and produced a nicely shaped stump that would fit well into a prosthetic limb once it healed. The stinky blackened foot and ankle were sent away on a tray to be bagged and transferred to pathology. After processing, the amputation specimen would be tossed onto the ever-present pile of excised and diseased human body parts awaiting incineration. Brad and Tom pushed hard and worked long hours to save as many patients as they could and be tops so they could impress their chief resident. When his internship ended on the last day of June, the chief wrote that Brad Rosedale was the best intern he had ever had. Perhaps it was because Tom's father was a surgeon and his mother a nurse that allowed him to forge through his residency with a happy face. Brad, on the other hand, had been caught by the futility of trying to help people hell-bent on destroying themselves. Chicago was a glittering city of polar opposites, an incongruous melting pot of diversity where somehow everything that needed to be done got done. He loved the city, the energy, the way the tall buildings downtown looked from the L on a ride around the loop. There was even a little slice of Lake Michigan's beach at Oak Street. In the summer, it reminded him of childhood trips to Long Beach. The second postgraduate year brought what he wanted, nonstop orthopedic trauma. From the moment he hit the hospital at 7 a.m. for intake rounds to the moment he headed for the parking lot 10 or 12 hours later, or 36 hours if he was on call, it was a constant stream of fractures, dislocations, gunshot wounds, tendon lacerations, and other musculoskeletal misfortunes. At the end of the year, he showed enough proficiency that the senior residents let him do some advanced surgeries with a medical student assisting. They kept it quiet from the director. Fortunately, their boss was so buried in administrative work or supervising the trauma clinic that the secret was safe. Looks good, said the orthopedic chief resident, standing in the doorway of the OR, holding the film up against the bright overhead lamp. After Brad had fixed the ankle fracture fragments with screws and plates, they were so well aligned that the fracture lines were barely visible. I like how you always get that plate bent just right to maintain the normal flare of the fibula. Are you measuring it with a goniometer or what? Brad chuckled. He had fixated so many bimalleolar ankle fractures that he could do it by eyeballing, but he knew better than to say that. I bend the plate, then hold it up in front of the x-ray of the normal side and keep bending it until it matches. Hey, buddy, you're good. Close up that incision and meet me in the lounge. Dawson's here. Matt Dawson was their reconstructive spine surgery attending. Brad had watched him expose an entire thoracic spine and insert Harrington rods in three and a half hours. The patient was a 14-year-old girl with severe scoliosis and a big rib hump. The problem with Dawson was that he wouldn't let the residents operate. They had to assist him. But he was so good, they would fight for a chance to scrub in, hold a retractor, and watch him work his magic. Dawson had a big private practice, and rumor had it he made over a million dollars a year doing spine surgeries. It wasn't exactly a rumor. He told it to the orthopedic chief resident who was asking about joining him in practice when he finished his training. Ever since that day, the chief had walked, talked, and dreamed about becoming a rich spine surgeon. After Brad wrote the post-op orders for the ankle fracture and checked that the patient could wiggle her toes, he went up to the lounge. But Dawson and the chief were already scrubbing for a decompressive laminectomy for a spinal stenosis patient. Surgery was over for the day, and the fracture clinic would start soon. It would be frantically busy and Brad needed to save his legs, so he got into an elevator and told the attendant to take him to the main floor. Summer came, and soon it was July 1st, a big day in university hospitals throughout the United States, as that was the day new interns arrived and chief residents graduated and went into private practice or a fellowship, and everyone in between got promoted to the next year. Brad started his third year as the junior resident on the fracture service, where he was greeted by Edward Cunningham, a third-year medical student from Loyola. Edward wasn't a typical med student. He arrived early, stayed until he was ordered to leave, and took extra call nights. 
He did scout work, like fetching lab results to make the residents' lives easier and reading up on their difficult cases, offering ideas. He knew his stuff. He reminded Brad of himself. Only four years ago at the University of Texas, I was Edward, working my ass off, coming to get into orthopedics. I have to help him out. OR day for the fracture service came and there was no surprise, another damn broken ankle. What was it about people in Chicago breaking their ankles all the time? In winter, it was the ice and in summer, it was the booze. Here they were operating on yet another bimalleolar ankle fracture. A 55-year-old, heavyset female who had slipped in the shower of her hotel room after imbibing at least two bottles of wine. Inebriated, losing balance on the slippery tub surface. She must have twisted her big body around the planted foot and snapped the fragile bones in her ankle. Well, what do you see? Asked Brad. They were standing in front of the x-ray view box on the rear wall of the OR. The patient was lying on the table where the anesthesiologist was intubating her. Looks like a supination external rotation injury, resulting in a bimalleolar fracture, probably a Lausch Hansen 4, Edward said. The words came slowly and carefully as though he were open to correction. You got it, man, said Brad. Tell you what, do you want to take on this case? Um, yeah. I was hoping I could assist you. No, I mean before the surgery. The incision, reduction, fixation, everything. A little voice rang in Brad's mind. No, you're crossing the line. No, you'll get kicked out of the residency if the director finds out. No, somebody will tell. He ignored the voice. He had lost count of how many ankle fractures he had fixed. He wanted a challenge, like a big spinal surgery. Or to use a microscope to reattach an amputated thumb. Anything but the old plate and screws job on some fool who slipped on ice. Or in this case, in a slippery bathtub. Okay, yeah, Uh, let me prep her leg. Edward was over the moon. No medical student got to do an entire surgery. He busied himself with applying the tourniquet to the comatose patient's thigh and started washing her leg and ankle with betadine. Brad had the circulating nurse finish the prep, and he took Edward to the sink for the ritual five-minute hand scrub. You got this, Edward. I'll talk you through it. Piece of cake. I can do these in my sleep. I'm a little nervous, but thanks. I'll give it my best. They stood together next to the swollen and deformed ankle, raised it, and exsanguinated the leg. Edward will make history, but nobody will know, thought Brad. The irony was not lost on him, yet there was a deeper implication, if it worked. They were ready to operate. Brad took a marking pen from the tray and drew a line for the incision. Scalpel, please. The nurse handed Dr. Rosedale a scalpel, and he passed it to the medical student, cut on the line. Edward made a shallow incision, barely breaking into the dermis. Again, but deeper, he instructed. This time, Edward almost hit the periosteum, which was fine with Brad. He compressed the wound with a cloth and put in self-retractors. Coagulate the bleeders. Edward took the electric cautery and zapped a few small venules that were oozing dark blood. Okay, man, Brad went on guiding him. Let's operate. Strip the periosteum off now and let's get this fracture exposed. Edward had studied anatomy and knew all the terms, but he'd only assisted a few times and he had much less experience than a nurse or an OR tech. Nonetheless, Brad had a point to prove. The broken ends of the fibula came into view and Brad handed Edward the bone clamp, and Edward was able to manipulate the fractured ends to come together while Brad held the foot and assisted. Okay, clamp it, buddy. The sound of metal ratchets came. Good job. Brad admired the reduced fibula fracture that was ready for the stainless steel plate. I'm going to do this part for you. It's a little tricky. Holding the plate in both hands, he deftly bent it at the third and fifth holes, causing a curve that would maintain the normal angle of the fibula. You can't imagine how much trouble someone will have if they don't bend the plate like this. A straight plate will cause the fibula to jam against the talus and they'll have a limp for the rest of their life. I've seen it happen. Brad slid the plate onto the fibula and over the fracture, clamping it on the bone. Drill, he said. The nurse had performed plenty of these procedures too. She had every tool ready before she was even asked. Brad drilled the first hole, showing Edward how to be careful not to plunge through the far cortex and damage deeper structures or the talus. After that, Edward took the drill and the procedure went smoothly. Drill, tap, screw. Drill, tap, screw. Brad carefully supervised each step so he could be sure that the anesthetized woman had every chance for an excellent result. In less than 30 minutes, the plate was on and they were taking x-rays. Edward had done it all except for one drill hole. It was perfect. The med student was elated. So was Brad, who was out to prove that anybody could be a surgeon or at least anybody with a reasonable brain and a little drive to succeed. He looked at the nurses to see if they cared that a medical student was operating. 
One looked at the clock, the other gossiped with the anesthesiologist. As long as they weren't operating on the wrong leg, they were good. That happened once at Cook County Hospital. Somebody had amputated the wrong leg and there had been a big fuss. A sign hung on the wall as if giving testimony. Check the side. The next step could be a disaster because the nerve and artery were less than an inch away from the fracture site. They would have to use a drill and screws without penetrating or injuring those critical structures. Edward made the incision, reduced and clamped the fracture, and put two screws in while Brad held retractors, talked him through it, and jealously guarded the sacred neurovascular bundle. The golden rule in orthopedic surgery was, don't cut the nerve or the artery. The final x-ray showed everything in place, and they sutured the wounds. Then they applied dressings, a plaster splint, and helped move the patient to a gurney. Brad got Edward away from the nurses for a moment. You did great. If you hadn't, I would have stopped you in a heartbeat, but... You can't ever, ever tell anyone you did the surgery. We are breaking some rules here. Sure. Wow. Okay. Edward was aglow. He decided at that moment he would do everything it took to become an orthopedic surgeon. For Brad, it was a revelation. Never again would he put a surgeon on a pedestal. Surgery was nothing more than a set of simple techniques repeated over and over. Hell, he could teach a monkey to do it. And he almost just did. Opportunities to meet his potential soulmate seemed to come out of the woodwork, but they wouldn't stick until he met Katie in the ER. As part of her nursing assistant program, she had to work a four-hour shift three evenings a week. And on one of those evenings, Brad was prepping a patient with a nasty compound tibia fracture for emergency surgery. He'd asked the student for a hand, and by the time the wet plaster was set, he had Katie's phone number and a date with the doe-eyed, sensuous Chicago native who was just a few years younger. Most of his colleagues, doctors and training included, were married, many with children. At the age of 26, when many were starting to plan or at least consider starting a family, having children terrified Brad. He had vowed in his soul he would never bring a baby into the world and risk inflicting on them what had happened to himself and his little brothers. But marriage to the one had always been a plan. Katie was a softly stunning beauty, charming and modest. She was easygoing, had a big heart, and everyone loved her. She likes to help people. We will be a great team. Months of romance ensued, and Brad got away from the hospital to meet Katie's family. They took long walks on the magnificent mile and picnicked in Lincoln Park. She stayed over at his apartment and made an amazing lasagna, and they talked for hours about their dreams and how they could make the world a better place. She showed more than she talked about her deep Christian faith, and it touched Brad's heart, enough to share with her the vision he had at 14. She said it was God's angels giving him a hint about his mission in life, and she would help him figure it out. When he asked her to marry six months after they first laid eyes on each other, she prayed about it, and God told her to say, yes. Brad prayed to God in gratitude. There would be no more searching for a soulmate and fantasizing about the one. Katie Rosedale was here and now, and she was wonderful. Brad focused on success, grabbing moonlighting opportunities like working at the Cook County Jail, and his income jumped. He put his extra money into mutual funds, which shot up 25% and qualified for a mortgage on a three-bedroom brick bungalow west of downtown Chicago, with a yard surrounded by a storybook white picket fence. For the first time in his life, he faced the possibility of being part of a normal family. But something felt wrong. All he did was work. When he wasn't staying all night at the hospital, he was coming home after 11 p.m. from a shift in the surgical dispensary, and he was going to the gym, which took part of his evening when he wasn't on call. Katie wanted to cook nice dinners, visit family and friends, and have together time in front of the TV or go out for a night on the town. He rejected all of that. If there was an opportunity to work harder and get rich, he was damn well going to take it. Katie came from a big, warm family, and her parents loved to entertain at their three-story North Chicago mansion. They were generous and nurturing and took Brad in like one of their own. On a holiday when Brad wasn't moonlighting or staying on an overnight hospital call, He and Katie would drive over and join the dozens of people gathered for a festive time. Katie's brothers drank beer and played billiards in the family room while friends and cousins splashed in the outdoor pool. People asked Brad about his work at Cook County Hospital, and their jaws dropped at his tales of gunshot wounds and amputations coming through the ER, which saw a thousand admissions every day. He would have a beer, get buzzed, look at the lavish winding staircase ascending to a spacious second floor landing and wonder how long it was going to take him to have a house like this. It made him feel like he was wasting time being at a party. Brad Rosedale had found his drug of choice, work. 
The guaranteed success from getting his MD was materializing. He had a beautiful wife, wonderful in-laws, and a better home than he'd ever expected as a child. But it wouldn't stop. He took a third job moonlighting at a private hospital where he covered the ER every Friday night for a five-man orthopedic group. Kitty implored him to work less, which he took as a sign that she didn't care about their future. Tired of being home alone, she started spending nights at her parents'. He would get home late, hoping to make love to his wife before they fell asleep in each other's arms. But the house would be cold and empty. Brad tried to blame Katie for needing the company of her friends and family, but it wasn't her fault. Few relationships can survive a true workaholic, especially one from a broken family. Who would have guessed that his next move would be decided by a bottle of beer? The bar on North Halstead was packed with the after-work crowd, and there weren't enough chairs for everyone. People stood, some fresh out of the cold and still in their caps, scarves, and overcoats, and sang drunken songs. I'm going across the street to find my friends, said Katie, pointing to a bar across the way. I think they're looking for me there. Okay, I'll wait here, said Brad. It was impossible to get through the jostling bodies to the bar, so he grabbed a waitress and asked for another bottle of Heineken. When the beer came, he took a swig and looked out the window across the street. He looked and looked and brooded. He had been in Chicago for over three years and suddenly realized that he didn't belong. At any gathering, everybody had a cousin, a sister, a childhood friend, or a coworker to commiserate and share dreams with, or just make small talk about the weather. Except for Brad Rosedale, it seemed. People around him were lit up, laughing, singing, and sharing. He was still looking at the window and saw no sign of Katie. He decided to go across the street with his beer and find her. It would be just like his wife to get pulled into a conversation and decide to hang out especially now that they were having problems. Leaving his scarf, cap, gloves, and overcoat hanging on a hook on a wall, he dashed out with the bottle of Heineken in his right hand, scanning for a break in the traffic. The cold air hit his nostrils, reflexively tightening his chest, which soon relaxed enough to allow some of the frigid air to enter. The cold seemed to suck the soul out of him. Ugh, I should have put those winter clothes on. I could stand right here and die in minutes. Katie had had the good sense to bundle herself up. His hands and ears burned, and he put his left hand in a pocket, still gripping the beer bottle. Finally, a break in the traffic on North Halstead gave him a chance to jog across four lanes. The bar she had pointed to was packed with people, but when he tried to enter, the door was locked. On it, a sign read, Emergency Exit Only. Shit, wrong door. By the time he made it through the correct door and into the bar, there was no feeling in his right hand. My God, dude, someone said. You were out there with no gloves or jacket? Are you trying to die or what? Others stopped and looked at him. He was shivering and hunkered down. There you are, said Katie. I found my friends. Oh my God, Brad, you look terrible. Where's your coat? It's record cold right now. A polar vortex had just arrived over Chicago and it was 26 below. I, I can't feel my hand. Can you take this bottle? His fingers and thumb were locked around the neck of the beer bottle and he was shivering. She pried his fingers, which were stuck to the glass surface, off it. He fought the pain but groaned when his thumb came loose. His fingers were red, showing early signs of frostbite, and his thumb was blue, showing loss of circulation. You poor thing, said Katie, looking over his hand with her pretty big brown eyes. Maybe you should go to the ER. No way, said Brad. Is he really a doctor? Asked one of her friends. What an idiot. Who goes outside in January without gloves and a coat? Katie glared at the friend she had known since grade school. Shut up, bitch, she said. He grew up in California. Oh, excuse me. Well then, go home, beach boy. A couple of years earlier, he would have been surprised and insulted. Now he just laughed. They all talked that way in Chicago in their gangster accents. It took a week for Brad's right hand to fully recover. And even then, there was residual numbness in his thumb. He managed to hide the temporary disability at work. But spending a few minutes at 26 below with a beer bottle was the big decider. There was no way he would stay in Chicago a day longer than he had to. They tried to talk about it. They discussed every possible scenario until it ended in tears. Loving each other deeply, their differences grew until love wasn't enough. Chicago winters didn't bother Katie in the least. She didn't want to leave the only place she knew or be separated from her people. The couple soon became ships passing in the night. When the time came for Brad to plan his move to California, Katie moved her things back to her parents' house and filed for divorce.